Well, I would invite you tonight to take your Bibles and open, please, to uh, the book of Matthew, chapter 28. Matthew, chapter 28. And I want you to, or actually, I'm sorry, chapter 21, excuse me. And tonight we're going to be looking at um, a different uh, parable. Um, you know, we are doing a study of First Timothy on Sunday night, but to be quite frank with you, I... Uh, had a distracting week and didn't get to finish everything that I wanted to study about Second Timothy. So I thought it would be good to look at this passage of Scripture here. We are uh, celebrating today the Palm Sunday, and uh, this is the beginning of Passion Week. So I thought I would just talk about a few events that took place uh, in the ministry of Jesus during this week. And in Matthew chapter 21, we're going to be looking at verses 33 down to verse number 46. A few years ago, a family living in a beautiful home in West Palm Beach, Florida, told a, fil a film crew that it was okay for, the, uh, for them to use their front lawn kind of as a set for filming an episode of a TV show. And they knew that, the, um, that there would be cars crashing violently in the front of the house, and they knew that all kind of things, special effects were happening there, kind of destroy the lawn just a bit. And uh, the owner of the home, while this was going on, the owner of the home actually called the uh, producer to ask what was going on. It's, it turns out that the people living in that home were simply tenants, and they didn't have the authority to say that you can destroy the front lawn while you're filming this show. Some awful stakes, mistakes can be made if tenants begin acting like they are owners. Um, you can, can you imagine uh, someone renting a beautiful mansion a plush uh, mansion that is fully furnished, and when it comes time to pay the rent, when the, uh, the owner sends people to uh, collect the rent, they threaten those people and actually beat those people up and say, how dare you try to collect rent from me? That would be ludicrous. No one would make that claim. No one making that claim would uh, stand a chance in a court of law. The, the owner has a right to receive the rent, and he has a right to have his property treated well. Well, that's kind of the theme of this parable here. This parable that we're going to look at tonight, uh, given by our Lord Jesus from verse 33 down to verse 46, we call this the parable of the vineyard, is a parable that it's designed to ask a question, uh, answer a question, I should say, that was given by the chief priests and the leaders and the Pharisees when they came to Jesus and they asked him a question. Look in Matthew chapter 21, look in verse number 23. Notice what it says, And when he was coming to the temple, the chief priests and elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching and said, By what authority doest thou these things? And who gave thee this authority? By what authority, Jesus, do you do the things that you've been doing on this week? Now, they were talking about uh, specifically what was, had taken place that week. It, that On Sunday, Jesus rode into Jerusalem to present himself officially as the Messiah. And then on Monday, he cursed the fig tree. He got up early in Bethany and went back into Jerusalem. He looked up for a fig tree to give fruit. It had big lush leaves, but there was no fruit on the tree. And of course, a fig tree will normally produce fruit before it grows leaves. It had a lot of foliage. It had no fruit. And when there's no fruit on the fig tree, Jesus cursed the fig tree. And that was a symbol, symbolic of the nation of Israel. Outwardly, Israel looked very religious, but they had no fruit of genuine faith. And so Jesus cursed the fig tree in a great symbolic action. And then he goes to the temple on Monday, and he cleanses the temple. He throws out the money changers. He basically takes possession of the temple that is his. And then on Tuesday, he comes back into the temple. He has full authority. He's in the temple, and he's teaching the people that are there. There's a large group of people that are there just listening to Jesus teach. And in the middle of all that, the Pharisees and the religious leaders come to Jesus and they ask him this question that we saw in verse 23, who gave you this authority? Who, in other words, we would say it in our vernacular, who died and left you, boss? Who put you in charge so that you could do all of these things? And in response to this question, Jesus gives a series of parables. He gives a parable in verses 28 down to verse 32, the parable of the two sons, and then later he'll give a parable of the wedding banquet in chapter 22 from verses 1 down to verse 14. This is kind of the middle parable. We call this the parable of the vineyard or the parable of the owner of the vineyard. 
And in this parable, Jesus does a masterful job of showing that the owner of the vineyard is God and Jesus is the son, and therefore, Jesus is the rightful heir of the vineyard. And as a rightful heir, he is acting under God's authority. The Jewish leaders have wrongfully usurped the authority of God. You see, they thought that they were the owners of the vineyard, but they're not. They're merely tenants. They're merely renters. They were acting like they owned the vineyard. And so really the fundamental question that you look at in this whole scenario is who is the one who owns the vineyard? Is it God or is it them? You know, and how we answer that question will determine how we live. If you believe that God owns a vineyard and that we're merely tenants, that we're simply renting, then we have to live in submission to his authority, right? We'll understand that we're accountable to him and we'll live accordingly. So let's look closely at this parable here, and I want you to see three aspects of it with me tonight. First of all, the content of the parable. Now, again, remember, as Jesus gives this parable, it's Tuesday. In just three days, he will be crucified. Uh, he is in the temple teaching. This delegation comes to him. Uh, there are many listening. The Bible says multitudes have come to hear him. It's a massive crowd. The relig- religious leaders are there also listening to him. Luke says that all the people that were there listening to Jesus teach were hanging on every word. And I believe that they're going to continue to hang on the words of Jesus as he gives these parables and that, because this was a confrontation that Jesus is having with these religious leaders. So notice that Uh, the planting, what I call the part of the parable I call the planting. Look at verse 33. And another parable, and here another parable, there was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about and digged a wine press in it and built a tower and let it out to husbandmen and went into a far country. This is a very common occurrence in Israel. Israel is divided into two kinds of lands. There's the flat land, that's where people would plant the harvest grain, There was also the hilly portion of the land of Palestine, and that's normally where they would plant vineyards. The hillsides of Palestine were covered with vineyards. If you go there today, you'll still see a lot of this, these tiered hillsides with vineyards planted in them. Now, in this day, a wealthy man would buy a large piece of land. He would develop it. He would turn it into a vineyard. He would make a a wine press, uh, cut out of bedrock sometimes. He would put a wall around it, and that, and the grapes would be crushed there in the wine press, and then the wine would run down into a lower basin, and from there they would put the wine press into wineskins or clay jars for storage. Now here is this wealthy man. He's the owner of this land, and uh, he basically has this vineyard. But then notice the partnership in verse 33 where it says, and he let it out to husbandmen. That is, he leased it to tenants. And again, this is very common. Uh, a man would uh, be a, what we would call an absentee owner. He would have a plot of land. Uh, he would be maybe in another country or somewhere far off, but he would allow tenant farmers to farm that land. And uh, these tenant farmers would have a contract with this owner. They would work the land, and when the produce came in, the, farm, the, the owner would get a portion of the fruits that were produced, and the tenant farmers would also get a portion of that that they had worked. They don't own the land, these farmers. They're simply custodians of the land. And these farmers had the freedom to work the land however they wanted to. They could be as creative as they wanted. They didn't have someone looking over their shoulder constantly since the owner was far away. And so they could just work. This was a great privilege. This was a wonderful opportunity as well as a great responsibility to work the land uh, the best that they could. They could work hard. They could give a Get, get a big produce, they can take a percentage for themselves, they give a percentage to the owner, and this is a great way for people to make a living. And so here is this man, he has these tenant farmers, they're, they're in a vineyard, they're working the vineyard. Notice the next part of the parable, the produce. Look at verse number 34. And when the time of the fruit draw near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen that they might receive the fruits of it. So the harvest time has come. It's time for the owner to collect what is his. And the owner of the vineyard expects to have uh, fruit. I mean, he's invested a lot of resources into this. He spared no expense to make sure that the farmer has all that he needs. He was very thorough in the way he prepared his vineyard and protected it. And so he built a hedge, a wall, a tower, a wine press. 
there would have been a contract, an agreed-upon portion that the owner was to get of the produce of the land. And he sends his servant to collect the rent, so to speak, to collect the fruits of this harvest. And so far, everything in this parable is very normal. And anyone listening would, be, would completely understand the whole scenario that Jesus is giving here. But what happened next would shock them to their very core. This is what I call the persecution. Look at verse 35. And the husbandman took his servants and beat one and killed another and stoned another. Now, what these tenant farmers did was unthinkable to the servants of the owner. After being so, treated so well by the owner of the vineyard, after being given such privileges and opportunity to work the land, they do something that is unthinkable. Instead of giving the owner the fruit that was due unto him, that was rightfully his, they mistreat the servants that come to collect the fruit. Notice in verse 35 it says, they beat his servants. Duro means to flog or to whip. Literally means to flay or to remove the skin. Many times when a person was beaten in this day, it was 40 stripes with a whip, and they could literally remove the skin. And so they would beat the the servant, because he was an official representative of the owner. And so really, who's this directed towards? It's directed towards the owner. This, this hatred is directed toward the owner. The listeners would see that, hear this, and they would think, this is, this is shameful, this is wicked, this is illegal. When Luke re- records this, he says, and he proceeded to send another slave, and they beat him also and treated him shamefully. The Greek word here is where we get our English word, traumatized. They traumatized the servants that he sent, and they sent them away empty. And in verse 35, it says that they killed another and stoned another. The word for killed here is the idea of a painful death. This is a cruel death, and they stoned another. Stoning is the kind of punishment that was used in Jewish executions, when capital punishment was pronounced against you, you would be stoned to death. Now, what would most owners do at this point? I mean, what would you do if you were in his shoes? Well, you would have the tenants, farmers arrested. You would have them prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. You would probably say, okay, that's enough, but not this owner. You know what he does? He does what many people would think is illogical or unreasonable, He shows incredible superhuman patience, and he keeps giving these wicked men a chance to do what is right, to give the fruit that they owe. And so look down at verse number 36, and again, he sent other servants more than the first, and they did unto them likewise. Mark 12, 5 adds, uh, beating some and killing others. He sends more, they do the same, beating some and killing others. Now, by all human standards, this owner is not a good businessman, but I'll tell you one thing, he's very patient. He's incredibly patient. But then I want you to see what I call the plot. The plot. Look down in verse number 37. But last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, they will reverence my son. After the brutal rejection and persecution of the owner's servants, the owner decides to send his son. This is incredible. At this point in the parable, the people listening are probably saying, you've got to be kidding me. He's going to actually send his son after the way he's been treated? Notice where it says last of all. This is the last person I'm going to send. This is the last opportunity for them to receive an official representative of me. This is the last time for them to recognize my ownership of the vineyard, to submit to my authority, to produce fruit and to do what's right. He says, you know, after all, if I send my son, they will reverence my son. In other words, the word reverence here is a word that literally means to be shamed and to respect. They'll see my son. They'll recognize my patience. The very presence of my son should shame them, and it will cause them to have respect, and it will cause them to repent. After all, of these shameful things that they've done, they'll come to realize how bad they were. Just the sight of my son, 
should bring reverence, should bring respect. Maybe these farmers had a low view of servants. Maybe they just didn't like the servants. Maybe if they just see my son, they will reverence him. And so what happens? Look at verse number 38. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him. Let us seize on his inheritance. When they saw the son coming, they, got, they huddled together in a group discussion, and they said, you know what? You know who's coming now? This is the owner's son. And you know what we can do? Let's, let's kill him. And then we can seize ownership of this vineyard. You see, under Jewish law, property not claimed by an heir within a specific period of time could be claimed by the first party, first one to claim it. It belongs to them if it's not claimed by an heir. So they thought, you know, if we get rid of the son and we wait just a little bit, we can go in and we can claim that land for our own. After all that this owner has done for these farmers, all his patience, all of his goodness, these guys did not reverence him. They did not um, reverence his son. And they... Uh, they didn't kill the son because it was a case of mistaken identity. You say, well, maybe they didn't see it was his son. Oh, no, they knew exactly who it was. That's the reason they decided to kill him. They killed the son precisely because they recognized who he was. They wanted the inheritance for themselves. Again, the question here is who owns the vineyard? They did not want to submit to the authority of God. Now, if the crowd is listening was shocked before now, they're blown away with what happens next. Look in verse number 39. And they caught him. This is the son. They caught him, and they cast him out of the vineyard, and they slew him. The word slew here is the same word for killed as used before, to die a painful, mournful death. They murdered him cruelly and mercilessly, and so that was it. They went after the son, and they killed the son. Now, notice the next portion I call the punishment, verses 40 and verse 41. By this time, Jesus has the crowd at the, and the religious leaders on the edge of their seat, and now he's going to involve them in the parable. He kind of pulls them in even more because he asks them a question in verse number 40. Uh, Notice what he says. And when the Lord, therefore, of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? Now, the religious leaders get to answer this question. What do you think the the Lord of the vineyard, the owner of the vineyard, is going to do to these wicked tenant farmers after they did all of this terrible, shameful, wicked, violent uh, things and actions? And the religious leaders, notice what they said in verse number 41. And they said unto him, he will miserably destroy those wicked men. There's a play on words here in the Greek. The word for wicked, kakos, and, uh, and, and the word for destroy is also kakos. So we could say it like this. He will kakos those kakos men. That is, we could say it like this. He will badly destroy those bad men. And that's exactly the right answer. That's the only reasonable thing to do here now. You have to come to grips with the idea that this is the appropriate judgment. And by giving this answer, what these religious leaders really don't realize is they're pronouncing their own judgment because that's exactly the scenario that they themselves are in. And notice what he'll do next in verse number uh, 41 It says, and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. The owner of the vineyard will give the vineyard to others who will give him the fruits that he desires. Now, I want you to see part two of this. Not only the the content of the parable, but notice number two, the characters in the parable. Now, in in order to understand what the Lord is saying here, we have to point to the characters here and what Jesus is talking about. First of all, there's the owner of the vineyard. Who's the owner of the vineyard? God. That's right. Very good. You get the first answer right. God. God is the owner. 
And just like the owner of the vineyard has wealth and resources, so God is the one who is the giver of every good and perfect gift. All that we have comes from his gracious, kind, benevolent hand. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. He owns it all. But then number two, the vineyard. Who does the vineyard represent? The vineyard represents Israel, the nation of Israel. Any Jew listening would have made this connection. Why? Well, because of all the metaphors used of Israel in the Old Testament, the the vineyard is the one that's used most about the nation of Israel. Write down Psalm 80, verse 8. You brought a vine out of Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it. It took deep root and filled the land. Here God is talking about Israel, and he compares them to a vine that he took out of Egypt, and he planted them in a choice place. He planted them in the promised land. And then also write down Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Let me sing, a beloved, uh, sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved, beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. And he dug it and cleared out the stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it, and he hewed out, hewed out the, the wine vat in it, and he looked for it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And here again, God is comparing the nation of Israel to a vine uh, being planted in a fr- fruitful place that instead of producing good fruit, it produced rotten fruit. And so, The vineyard represents the nation of Israel. And then the tenant farmers, we already know, the tenant farmers represent the religious leaders of Israel. These are the ones who were given charge over God's vineyard. They were to be the custodians. They were the ones who were to take care of the nations. They were not the owners. They were simply the stewards of what belonged to God. They were the ones who were responsible to lead the people to worship God the way that they were supposed to worship him. And God puts it in puts it in the hands of the priesthood, certain rulers, godly men, elders, wise men. And then, remember in the parable, the owner goes on a long journey, on a journey for a long time. What's that? That's 2,000 years of Old Testament history, we could say. Um, The long journey pictures Old Testament history. God gave to the religious and spiritual leaders of Israel the care of the nation of Israel uh, to he gave that to kings. He gave that to the priests. He gave that from the patriarchs of Abraham all the way on to all of the kings. That was all entrusted to them. In Jesus' time, it was the high priests. It was the chief priests. It was the scribes. It was the Pharisees, the elders, and so on. They had the spiritual stewardship of the nation. And then the servants of the owner. Who does this represent? The servants of the owner. Well, this represents the prophets. Uh, that God sent. Just like the owner is sending servants, he, God sent prophets to the nation of Israel. What did Israel do to those prophets? They persecuted them. They beat them. They stoned them. They killed them. Jewish tradition tells us that Isaiah was, had, was sawed in two with a, with a saw. Um, from the Scriptures, we know Jeremiah was beaten with 39 stripes. He was put into stocks put into a a mud pit. He was eventually stoned to death. Ezekiel was rejected. Elijah and Amos had to run for their lives. On we could go throughout the New Old Testament. Zechariah was actually murdered in God's own temple. I mean, the history of the Old Testament is a history that bears witness to the murderous hearts of the leaders of Israel whose wickedness culminates not in just the killing of the servants, the prophets, but also will culminate in the killing of the Son of God. Now, later that same day, Jesus said to these same Jewish scribes and Pharisees that you're guilty of the sins of your fathers. You're guilty of their sins. In fact, look in Matthew chapter 23 and look at verse number 29. Jesus is pronouncing woe on them. And notice what he says here, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because ye build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous and say, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. You know, Jesus says, you know, you, you, like to, you like to whitewash the tombs of these old prophets. You like to give them honor now and you say, oh, if we had lived back then, we wouldn't have treated them that way. And Jesus 
calls them hypocrites because look what he says down in verse number 31. Wherefore, ye be witnesses unto yourselves that ye are the children of them which killed the prophets. Fill ye up the measure of your fathers. And then later on he'll say, you know, what your fathers did to the prophets of the Old Testament, you're going to do to my servants that I send out. You're going to do the same thing to them when I send them out. You're going to, and, and, and eventually they certainly did do that. They certainly did persecute um, the ones that Jesus sent out. Um, look at verse 34. Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them ye shall kill and crucify, and some of them ye shall scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city. You're going to do the same thing to the servants that I send out. So you're, the, you're guilty of the same sin here. Now, the son, the heir of the owner, who is that? We know that. That's Jesus, right? That's obvious. The son of the owner is the Lord Jesus. And again, the message here to the religious leaders is, the vine is not yours. It belongs to my father. He sent me. My authority comes from the fact that I am his son. You want to know where I get the authority to do what I do and say what I say? That comes from the fact that I'm the son of the father. That's where it comes from. I'm the son of the owner of this, vi- of this vineyard, which means it's mine. I have the right to cleanse the temple. I have the right to teach and heal. I have the right to curse the fig tree. I have the right to pronounce woe against the religious leaders here, the hypocrites here. I get all of that authority because I am the son. Now, this parable is not just a parable. It's also a prophecy of what is going to happen three days from that very day. This is Tuesday when Jesus is giving this parable. And on Friday, he will be crucified. And this parable alludes to the details of Jesus being crucified. Just as the son of the owner was taken out of the city, Jesus will be taken outside of the city of Jerusalem and crucified. And he will be killed not because they didn't recognize him, but because they did recognize who he was. They knew who he was. That's the point here that Jesus gives in this parable. They don't want his authority over him. There's a lot of people today, they hate Jesus, not because they don't know who he is, but because they do know who he is. Because they do understand he is the Son of God. They just don't want him being Lord over their life. They don't want him calling the shots in their life. They don't want his authority. So when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the previous Sunday, on Palm Sunday, the day that we celebrate today, and the people cried, Hosanna, they were quoting out of Psalm 118, verse 26. And now Jesus is going to quote out of that same Psalm, Psalm 118, but he's going to quote from verse 22. Notice what he says here. Um, In verse number 42, Jesus said unto them, Did ye never read in the Scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? The same is become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. And so that's Psalm 118, verse 22. A a cornerstone, as you know, is the most important stone in a building. It, It is the stone for which all the other stones get their alignment and form and structure. It is part of that foundation. It gives symmetry. It gives order. It gives, it gives uh, stability to the entire building. And sometimes builders, when a cornerstone was given, it was hewed out of the quarry and sent to the building site. Builders sometimes would look at that cornerstone and they would reject it, saying, no, it's not right. There's a story told about when the Temple of Solomon was being built. The cornerstone was cut. It was put, put into the site where the temple was being built, and the builders there didn't recognize this, this odd-shaped stone that was cut, and so they rejected it. They, they, they pushed it over the hill, and a cry came back and said, you know, send the cornerstone, and the quarry said the cornerstone was already sent. They just rejected it. They didn't recognize it, and finally, they saw that stone, and they recognized that it was the right stone. It was the cornerstone, and here uh, this is being referred to, I think, here in this psalm. 
Uh, and what Jesus does here is he kind of changes metaphors. The builders are the religious leaders, and the stones that the builders rejected is Jesus. But the stone which these builders rejected will become the cornerstone in the building. They will reject that stone. They will crucify that stone. But that stone will rise again, and it will be his resurrection upon which the whole church is built. All of it will be built upon the cornerstone, the Lord Jesus Christ. The foundation of our faith is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Look in verse number 43. Therefore I say unto you, say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. Therefore the kingdom of God is going to be taken from the Jewish leaders and given to the, we could say, the church of the Gentiles, and those Jewish believers. But notice in verse number 44, and whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. Wow, what a powerful verse. The Jewish leaders who fell on Jesus and put him to death, they themselves will be broken into pieces. You can't destroy Christ. And whoever Jesus the stone falls on will be broken and will be ground into pieces. This is the idea of judgment. You might reject the stone now, but you're going to fall upon that stone and you will break yourself against that stone. And furthermore, that stone will fall upon you and it will grind you. It will pulverize you into nothingness is what he's saying here. And so the future tenants in this parable, who is that? That is the church. That's the church. And later on, Jesus will send out his disciples, and the gospel will go out, and the Lord will build and is building his church. That's what he is doing. Now, let me give you a third part of this. We talked about the content of the parable. We talked about the characters of the parable. But let me give you number three, what I call the conclusions from the parable. The conclusion of the parable is... Uh, the vineyard belongs to the owner, God, and his son, and we must submit to his authority or suffer the consequences. This was true of Israel historically. And ver again, in verse 41, he will miserably destroy those wicked men. That literally happened. I've told you about this before. In 70 AD, God judged the nation of Israel. God destroyed uh, the city, the temple, there was destroyed. Uh, the Roman general Titus just came in and he just completely destroyed it all. It was God's judgment to this unbelieving generation. Tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of Jews were slaughtered and the city and the temple was leveled to the ground. From that moment on, there's been no priesthood that existed in Israel, no temple, no sacrifices, no ceremonies, no, no Sadducees, no Pharisees, no chief high priests, the whole system ended. It has never been restored from that time. But I want you to understand tonight that this parable is not, not just to Israel. This parable is also to us. So in the last few minutes here, let me give you five conclusions for us personally. Here's the first one. Number one, God expects fruit from his people. God expects fruit. Why bother to plant a vineyard if you don't expect fruit? And just as God had done all he could for Israel so that they would produce fruit, that's what God does for us today. What, what more does God need to do for us than what he's already done? He's given us his word. He supplies us with all we need that pertain unto life and godliness. He's given us his Holy Spirit. He wants us to bear the fruit of Christ's likeness in our lives so that those that are hungry, those that really want to know Jesus, can see Christ in us. They can see that the Lord is good. And I think this applies especially to us who live in America. We are perhaps the most spiritually privileged people in all history. God has given us the word in our language. We have an almost endless supply of spiritual resources. What resource do you need? You can just get it. We've got the Word of God everywhere. We've got it on our mobile phone in 50 different versions. We've got it all over. We've got everything we need. 
We've got all the resources that God could give. What's our excuse for not bearing fruit or not being Christ-like? We have more leisure time than any other nation in history to produce spiritual things. We are blessed with financial resources to support the work of God here and around the world. And I want to tell you something, beloved. With these great privileges comes great responsibility. We're responsible to bear fruit for the owner of the vineyard. All of us are either living for ourselves, for our own gratification, or we're living to bear fruit for God through his son, Jesus Christ. We're either laboring for what we can get out of the vineyard or we're laboring so that we can produce fruit for the owner of the vineyard. And so the question is, what are you doing to bear fruit in your life? Are you serving the Lord? Are you engaged in some kind of ministry where you're giving out, teaching a Sunday school class, investing in the lives of the next generation? And i got to tell you, beloved, that's my big concern. Our children are being bombarded all over the place. They need godly people that will come along and disciple them and mentor them and teach them the Word of God. And what a joy it is to be be used by God to lead a young child to Christ and disciple them and show them the things of God. There's nothing greater you can do with your life than to do that sort of thing. But here's the next thing. God's great patience should motivate us to submit to him. You know, God's patience is seen in the fact that he graciously continues to send messengers and prophets to a stubborn and rebellious people. When we read this parable, we're overwhelmed with the great patience of God to just continually send servants after they've been shamefully treated, for God to be patient and just to continue on sending. You know, I tell you this, I'm thankful that God is patient with me sometimes when I can be stubborn in my own spiritual life. Thank God that he sends us people who proclaim his word. He sends us messengers. He sends us friends to warn us perhaps of things in our life. God might graciously send problems to teach us to be dependent on him. He might send us health problems to show us that we're frail and we're dependent on him. And then know that eternity's coming, and we only have a short time to really bear fruit for God. What are some of the messengers that he sends? Gray hair, loss of hair, loss of youth, loss of strength, perhaps the death of a loved one or the death of a friend, again, to remind us that the eternal is what matters, that our time here is such a short time. It's not that long. We only have a few years here to really bear fruit for God. We have all eternity to celebrate the, 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 the work that we were able to do for God's glory. All of these gracious messengers given over and over are to remind us that eternity is near and we must give account to Almighty God for our life. A third thing I would say is God's great love in sending a son should motivate us to submit to him. Again, we're amazed by the owner's patience and his grace that God would send his son to these wicked people, that God would do that. The father knew his son would be rejected, yet he sent them anyway. If we could only grasp the infinite love of God who sent his son to this world that is so corrupt. I mean, have you ever thought about all the crud that God sees in this evil world every day? everything that God has to see. You know, I feel sorry for law enforcement officers because they see the more seamy side of life than most of us. They have to deal with rape, assault, murder, child abuse, every kind of crime that you can name. But you know what? God sees it all. He sees everything. He sees all the sin. He sees all the evil. He sees the evil that's in the hearts of men. And God continues to be patient. That is amazing to me. Martin Luther once said, if I were God and the world treated me as it treated him, I would kick the wretched thing to pieces. I think I agree with Martin Luther. We can identify with those feelings. But how did God treat this evil world? God commended his love towards us 
and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Knowing that he would bear the penalty for every sin that we would ever commit, Jesus was still willing to take on human flesh and to come to this wicked world. Like the songwriter says, amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, should die for me? That's, again, it boggles the mind. Let me just give you one more, and we'll be done tonight. God's judgment on those who reject his Son should motivate us to submit to him. And this parable illustrates what Paul talks about later in Romans eleven twenty two. Behold then the kindness and the severity of God. God's kindness is seen in sending more servants to this rebellious people, more than she deserved. His severity is seen when these wicked tenants kill the farmer's son and and, and then God judges them severely. Jesus is God's final messenger. He is the sum of God's revelation to sinful man. If, if, if anyone rejects Jesus, there's no further remedy. There's nothing else. You reject Jesus Christ, God has no other proposal for you. You know what's left? Nothing but judgment. Severe judgment. Because you have rejected his son. And so you might wonder, you know, again, maybe they, maybe these religious leaders, when Jesus gave this parable, maybe, maybe it went overhead. Maybe they didn't understand he was talking about them. Well, look at verse number 45 as we close of chapter 21. And when the chief priests and Pharisees had heard this par- the, the, his parables, they perceived that he spake of them. You talking to me? Are you talking about me? They perceived, they understood. This is all about them. They got it. Verse 46. So, they, so when they understood it was about them, they repented, and they said, Oh, Lord, forgive us. Look at verse 46. But when they sought to lay hands on, um, on the son, when they lay hands on him, they feared the multitude because they took him for a prophet. They wanted to kill him all the more. There was no repentance here. There was nothing but hardness of heart. And so when you're confronted with the truth, there's only going to be two reactions. Either you'll receive the truth, get right with God, or you're going to reject the truth, and you're going to want to hurt the messenger. And that's what they did. That's what they wanted to do. And and, and eventually, in just three days, they would get what they wanted. They would crucify the son, thinking they got rid of him. But again, the cross was the greatest triumph for us ever when Jesus willingly went to the cross for us. A Welsh minister was beginning his sermon. He leaned over the pulpit and he said to the people there, he said, friends, I have a question to ask. He said, I cannot answer it. He said, you cannot answer it. If an angel from heaven were here, he could not answer it. If the devil of hell were here, he could not answer it. Every eye was fixed on him, and he said this. The question is this. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? How shall we escape? There is no escape from that. Let's bow for prayer together. Our Father, again, we thank you for your precious word. We thank you for this narrative of Matthew that reveals to us the beauty of Christ. It reveals to us that he was the true Messiah, the Son of God, who came to come and bear the sins of the world upon himself. Father, we recognize that you are the owner, the rightful owner, and the authority of all, this vineyard, Lord, is yours. It's, we are the tenant farmers, Lord, that's been entrusted to us for a time. And, Father, you've given us all the resources we need to bear fruit for your glory. And, Lord, we have to look at our own heart and our own life and ask ourselves the question, am I bearing fruit? Am I profitable? 
Is the grace that you invested in me bearing fruit for the kingdom of God? Lord, are people seeing the fruit of Christ in my life? Am I a profitable investment for you, Lord? I pray that that will be so. Because we know, Lord, that whatever days we have left upon this earth, there are few. It's not long. It's a short time. And eternity is, has no end. And so, Lord, help us to take whatever days that you give us and to produce fruit in this vineyard for your glory so that you will be honored in all that we do. And, Father, we pray this in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen.